um, meet uh, Dan Donnelly, who is sketched here a little incongruously in gentleman's attire. He's a champion prize fighter of the 1810s. Uh, during, and during this period, um, the rules of that sport permitted not just bare knuckle brawling, but also butting, eye gouging, and hair pulling. Uh, he is Ireland's first proper sports celebrity. Huge crowds came out to see him fight in the Curra, where there's now a monument to him. Um, the fact that his victories were over English opponents added greatly to his popularity in Ireland. He's considered to be a very good but rather flawed fighter, not least because of his fondness for alcohol, which does in fact contribute to his early death. So he's an example of the pitfalls also of sporting celebrity. Um, thanks, Terry. This is an image of Joey Dunlop taken by a fan who was a friend of the, uh, the author of the entry in the early 1990s at the Isle of Man TT races. And by chance, I grew up there, so I've always had an interest in Dunlop, if a little bit more than the sport. Dunlop hailed from Ballymoney County, Andrew, and was a superb self-taught mechanic who grew up in a cohort of friends who just loved racing bikes. And they were known as, known as the Armoy Armada. He started in local road racing and graduated to his first race in the Isle of Man in 1976, and he went on to win 26 TT titles, a record to this day. At his last appearance in 2000, he was aged 48, and he claimed three TT titles that week, something very, very rarely done. He did it three times, and he tops the all-time list to this day. Now, his nephew, Michael, in, Ju in June, won his 23rd title and is in third place. So it's, it's something of a family affair, road racing with the Dunlops. Um, Dunlop particularly excelled at what, what we call en engine management, getting the most out of your engine, and also developed an absolutely encyclopedic knowledge of the 38-mile course that c constitutes the TT race. Um, he very tragically died in 2000 in Tallinn, Estonia, um, racing there. And under, during his many trips to Eastern Europe where he would bring charity supplies, on one of them he took a detour to visit Imola in Italy to visit the shrine to uh, Ayrton Senna, which I think speaks to something about the tragedy and the respect that road racers and motor racers have for each other. Okay. Uh, this photo of Mabel Cahill gives you a sense of the unwieldy attire that 19th century women tennis players were obliged to perform in. Um, after emigrating to New York City, she gets the benefit of the higher standard of tennis that then prevailed in Ireland, and she goes on to dominate tennis in America between 1890 and 1893. She's not a popular champion in America, being much criticized for her masculine style of play, which we should take to mean she was very energetic about the court. Um, retiring from tennis, she moves to England, uh, falls into poverty, and eventually dies obscurely in a workhouse. So she is an example, I suppose, of the difficulties many people encounter upon retiring from elite sport. This is an image of Michael Cusick that's taken from a cropped photo of the TCD second 15 rugby team that was taken in the late 1870s. I think it's fair to say, as Terry said, it captures something of Cusick's pugnacity. Um, and he would not look out of place on a present day front row uh, team. Um, Cusick's is an incredibly fascinating figure. He taught at Blackrock and Clongos colleges and then established his own academy in Dublin, captaining the rugby team. And he played rugby occasionally into the 1880s. But as a sportsman, he really enjoyed playing cricket, played hurling and football, and excelled at the high jump and weight throwing events. And it was engaging with athletic events that led him to sort of really, really perceive perniciously the social elitism and the widespread gambling that was latent in Victorian sports culture in Dublin and Ireland. And he really embraced the Gaelic revival. He was a native Irish speaker from the Burren, and he was present at the famous meeting at Hayes Hotel in Thurles in November 1884, founding the GAA. And he's an absolutely fascinating figure. Uh, this is Molly Gill in her Komogi uniform. Um, as you can see, it's fairly constrictive, though an improvement on what Mabel Cahill was wearing earlier. Uh, Molly is a fervent advocate of women's right to play sports. She's also easily the best Komogi player of the first generation of Komogi players. She plays on into her mid-40s, which is long enough for her to win two All-Ireland medals with Dublin. These are the first All-Ireland Komogi championships held in the early 1930s. She's also president of the Camogie Association from 1919 to the late 1930s. As such, she presides over a period of expansion in her sport, while also striving to preserve her association's independence from the male-dominated GAA. Gender politics does, however, play a role in her eventual ousting as president of the Camogie Association. This is an image of Pat Taff um, on Arkell in the Rothconnell Roth handicap 
hurdle in NACE in 1962. And even establishing that took a couple of days' work because one of the great joys of this volume was locating images and finding out if the image actually contained who it was said to uh, contain. Taf hailed from Athkul and his father had been a successful uh, Grand National winning trainer and his brother Toss was also a prominent jockey. Uh, Taff really came into his prime in the 1960s as the jockey, just as he came across the, fam the yet-to-be-famous Arkel, who was coming to the fore, and, they, and Taff soon began to train the horse. He was the only jockey to ride him over fences, and together they won 22 of their 26 steeplechases, including three consecutive Cheltenham Gold Cups, before Arkel retired in the end of 1966. Taff himself retired in 1970 as the leading jump jockey of his generation, and perhaps an even greater accolade, he went on to become a very successful trainer in his own right, and he's one of about three or four lives from equine and horse culture we have in the volume, um, which is one of the joys of putting it together. Uh, Bill McCracken's successful career as a fullback for Newcastle United highlights some of the growing pains associated with the early days of professional sport. Um, thus, his transfer to Newcastle United becomes the subject of an FA investigation amid claims of secret payments. Likewise, he goes nearly a decade without playing for Ireland due to a dispute over money. Uh, he achieves notoriety for his clever exploitation of the offside law, eventually almost single-handedly forcing the authorities to change the offside law. Uh, his tactics are widely considered to be unsporting, and opposing fans regularly pelt him with coin, fruit and other missiles. For his part, he revels in this controversy and is, a, is an instance of how sport thrives off having villains as well as heroes. And this photo here gives you a good sense of his swagger and self-confidence. Um, this is an image of Elizabeth LeBlond taken from um, her book, True, True Tales of Mountain Adventures. And it's really interesting to see what she's wearing to climb there. She was really a true aristocrat, presented at court in her teens. She had never laced her own boots or shoes before she was in her mid-twenties, having been basically dressed by her maid every day. She first visited Chamonix in the French Alps for health reasons around 1881, and that was the beginning of her interest in mountaineering and winter sports. She went on to tobag toboggan, ice skate, um, but it was in, as a climber over the next two, two decades in the Alps and also in Norway that she really made an impact, um, undertaking many first ascents, new climbs and new routes, and she became really one of the most successful climbers of men or women of her day. LeBlanc was a pioneer of mountain photography, which, uh, I'm sorry, and also of filmmaking in the mountains, and one of the very earliest women filmmakers. And she published many travelogues, not just about her climbing, but also her travels in Europe and Africa, and a lot of journalism too. Um, here you can see her wearing climbing attire, but very interestingly, she would only leave the village dressed in conventional skirt, and when, when out of sight of the village or the local climbing settlement, would change into this, what she called rational dress, which I think was Terry stressed with two of the other women in the volume, dress and gender are much, really part of uh, the, their lives and absolutely fascinating to read about now. Uh, an accomplished equestrian in her, her own right, Nanny Power O'Donoghue is notable mainly for popularising horse riding among women, specifically among socially aspiring middle class women such as herself. Um, she writes two very influential best-selling books in the 1880s which give advice to women horse riders. Uh, much of her advice is ahead of its time, with the important exception of her firmly held belief that women should always ride side saddle and never astride a horse. In this, she was upholding a long-held convention that crumbles only in the early 20th century. Nonetheless, her contradictory attitudes, her partial feminism, is important for showing how women could pursue this particular sporting pastime without forfeiting either their femininity or social respectability. This is an image of uh, Terry or Teresa Mullen, um, taken from when she won the gold medal in the Bowls event at the 19, 19, 1988 Seoul Olympics. Uh, sorry, Seoul Paralympics. Excuse me. And this was the first time that she competed outdoors and also outside of Britain and Ireland. And she travelled to Seoul at the, uh, against the advice of her medical team and her support and her family because she was not just uh, paraplegic at that point, but also enduring a very serious bout of cancer. Every day she left her uh, sickbed to compete and returned immediately to rest. Um, it's quite an amazing story in and of, in and of itself. To me, this is a really important entry to be in the book for a number of reasons, but when we came to track down images, which was a true joy, you would not believe how many organizations we contacted who did not have an image of Terry Mullen, Irish, 
British Isles, international uh, specialist organisations. Eventually, um, I, I went back to the newspaper archives, The Wonder of Digitisation, and I found an article mentioning her sister, an Eileen Barron of Rohini. I then found mention of Eileen in a death notice uh, during COVID, and that allowed me to find likely numbers in an old hard copy phone book. Do you remember those? A few Barons in Rohini, I rang for months and months and months, and eventually her sister picked up the phone and we tracked down an image. And I'm really proud of that coming into the volume uh, and also the range of lives that we're representing uh, in the collection we've put together.